Hello, I am Kevin Alcuni, adult librarian from the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library. And today I'm excited to be presenting today's LA May program, Tales of the Silk Road. First, I wanna thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA May programs to you virtually. LA May focuses on the diverse landscape of, the, of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And for our LA May programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts that highlight the library's diverse resources and all our upcoming programs, including an upcoming conversation between poet and best-selling New York Times writer, Hanif Abdul-Raqib and Courtney Lilly, head writer for the ABC television show, Blackish, where they will be discussing, discussing Hanif's new book, A Little Devil in America. This event will take place on Saturday, June 26th at 11 a.m. But today we welcome Christopher Garcia and George Abe, who will be playing and presenting traditional and new music from indigenous instruments of India, Japan, and more. So take it away, Christopher. Thank you very much for having us this afternoon. Hopefully you're at home, knowing that our libraries will be opening relatively soon, and uh, the rest of the world, along with our own worlds, kind of get back to uh, what we used to call normal. I am sitting with George Abe, and who is playing instruments from Japan, uh, shakuhachi, yakubo, uh, temple bowls, and uh, more as we go along, seashells. Uh, I am playing instruments of India, Northern India specifically today, and frame drum and some metals. Um, I'm gonna ask George to uh, talk about uh, a little bit about the concept of ma in Japanese music. Ma, not mother, but ma. It's a space, it's a, it's a term taken from architecture actually. It's a space between pillars in a house or a, a temple. The space between. Much of my music in terms of for this, especially for this instrument, the shakuhachi, has a lot of space. The space is described as ma. It's a expression that has to do with, in the case of music, with breath rhythm. That it's not metronomic. It's not based on four four or things like that, or a, a steady beat. The song determines the spacing between notes.
George and I are both from uh, Los Angeles, uh, born and raised in East Los Angeles and uh, South Central. Uh, we have each traveled all over the world uh, playing music on our respective instruments uh, on a few continents, a few countries, 28 countries. Um, and uh, we take ourselves and everything we are, each of us, that means you too, wherever we go and we get to experience other places, other people, foods, cultures, thought, etc. And I'm going to ask George uh, to talk a little bit about uh, his travels uh, to India and Japan recently. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, we, our group, uh, I belong to a taiko group, Japanese drums. Uh, we collaborated with a group from Orange County, Arpana. Baharata uh, Matyam, classical Indian dance. Um, and we put a program together, uh, actually toured six cities in South India. Uh, while we were there uh, in Delhi, we took a little side trip, of course, down to Agra, where the Taj Mahal is. The Taj Mahal was a little disappointing, not, not, not the architecture and the building itself, but it was too crowded, you know, it was just kind of had a Disneyland kind of rushy kind of a feeling to it. So I, I just kind of got tired of it and I sat on the lawn outside of the Taj Mahal and I uh, brought out my Japanese flute and I started playing in an Okinawan scale. A family from Gujarat. And then his wife and two children sat down while I was playing. And when I stopped, they, they asked me questions about, well, is that an Indian flute? Uh, it sounded like an Indian scale that you were playing. But uh, so, so I got into a long conversation with them. And I, what I was explaining to them was I was playing in an Okinawan scale. Yeah, Okinawa is part of Japan now. But really, it has its own culture, its own music. Uh, and to me, the Okinawan culture and, and music, especially, has a, has a kind of a almost Polynesian feel to it, kind of islandy music. And I, I really love those scales that the 
And I was playing in this kid, and I, I explained that to them, and they said, well, that's interesting, because it sounded very much like an Indian scale. Of course, <laughs> Indian scales are plenty of uh, uh, Okay, so the next piece we'd like to do is on tabla and yokopue, uh, which are Japanese side flute. We call it Okinawan Rock. The next piece is uh, taken from a Sufi um, scale. Again, I'll be using uh, the, the Japanese flute with it, and um, Chris will be playing a frame drum. Um, this scale uh, was taught to me when I was doing an interfaith theater, theatrical piece uh, by a, a Sufi woman. And, um, the scale she described as having a story that it had to do with going out the front door, crossing the threshold, going out onto the road and traveling through life. Yeah. Metaphor. So, so road. Yeah. Um, so, hijaz, Sufi hijaz, it's an improvisation. Thank you. 
George and I uh, met quite a few years ago, uh, and actually at a library presentation, which actually we don't do that many of. Like we maybe do, we've maybe done five or six in four or five years because we each uh, perform a lot. And uh, although we're in, La we live in Los Angeles, we, we're not actually a lot of times in Los Angeles. <laughs> um, uh, with COVID, it has been interesting in the last year. Um, so what happens with uh, traveling as we travel around the world, uh, we understand that each place, each person, each thought, each thing has a resonance. And the Silk Road, with people traveling and leaving their place, they shared who they were, what they were, with trades, goods, culture, spirituality, and religion. So this only happens actually with traveling. Uh, for many uh, years, you know, the people, as an example, the people who wrote the Bible were unaware that you know, Africa existed or that Mesoamerica existed. And Mesoamerica was unaware that the Middle East existed. Uh, so all of these people lived within a very small space. And while there are many ideas within that small space, which are usually uh, to do with ethnicity and culture, once you realize there's other ethnicities and cultures out there, you can't not acknowledge they don't exist. And it was the first time I, I heard somebody uh, define the word new age. Uh, I had never heard of it defined that way. What they were saying is we are in a new age, meaning that whatever happens on the other side of the world, we know about it instantaneously. It doesn't take us decades or weeks or years or hundreds of years to understand that these people exist or that we exist and that we coexist. So to keep living within our boxes is kind of unusual because it's kind of hard to live in a box when you find out there's a few million other boxes out there. Um, so hopefully uh, the way to get beyond that is through resonance. Every person, every place, every thought, every idea has a resonance. Standing on top of the pyramid of the sun in Teotihuacan is not the same resonance as standing on the corner of uh, Wilshire and La Brea. They each have their own resonance, the people, the places, the things, our thoughts. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna play this piece called uh, uh, Darshan, which is uh, like a homage to resonance using this gong.
next piece we'd like to do um, is called Hikikito. It's a Japanese folk song. It's the song sung by women who sit and grind grain. They use two pieces of granite, like wheels, kind of like wheels, with their serrated one edge. And uh, they use a, a stick that's inserted into a bowl in the top piece of granite. They turn it and they sing this song as they work. <coughs> so it's a woman's work song. But it, it has some really choice philosophy. Um, what I'll do is play on the shakuhachi uh, the intro and one verse, uh, and then sing one verse in Japanese. So you get a feel for what the song sounds like. And then I'll kind of like go through a, a quick translation of, of the song because it, it's so, I, I, I find it very meaningful. So this is Hikigito. bridge to Ia like a spider's web. It sways, it sways. There is no wind, but it sways. It sways, it sways. There is no wind, but it sways. Divine bridge of Ia, if we hold hands and cross it together, nothing to fear. Hold my hand, we cross together. There is nothing to fear. Old woman grinding grain, how old are you? I am as old as the stick that turns the grinding stone. I am old as this turning stick that grinds the grain. I am old as work.
the instruments we play, we learn them from uh, elders that we approach about the possibilities of learning the instrument. Uh, I first heard North, these North Indian drums called tabla on a record, and uh, and I'm from East Los Angeles, and in 1975, 76, there were no uh, musicians or in India living in Los Angeles to learn from. And in 2021, there are still no musicians of India <laughs> living in East Los Angeles to learn from. So this was, George and I are pre-internet people. So, uh, uh, you know, we couldn't go to a computer because they weren't around. We couldn't go to the internet because it didn't exist. Uh, we couldn't go to YouTube. That doesn't happen. We had to go to this place with four walls, a building. The first building I went to actually was a library looking for books on uh, music of India in East Los Angeles. And at that time, there were none. So I ended up going to a record store and uh, buying records and reading the liner notes because that's as good as it was going to get. So at that time, world music did not exist as a genre. Uh, we had the international section. So you would have three records of China, two records of Japan, two, you know, mariachi records. Uh, world music did not exist. So I went to study the tabla and uh, I found out that it was an oral tradition and I had been playing music for many years on drums by ear. I didn't know how to read or write. And uh, I found out that I could uh, study and uh, Three places to study at that time were Wesleyan University in Connecticut, UCLA, and CalArts. These are, at that time, they were the only accredited institutions. So uh, I went to learn, and I found out that the, the tradition is oral. So every stroke has a, every finger on the drum. Has a specific sound. Na din tun ta ti te da na gi 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 ka. So you learn these basic sounds, which are like letters of an alphabet. Letters in and of its, themselves don't mean anything. You put the letters together, you get words, you get words, you get sentences, you get sentences, you get paragraphs, you get paragraphs, you get stories. So some of these pieces might be like an etude, they might last three or four minutes. There's different forms. Some of them might last hours. So, uh, your teacher, you would have to recite back before you played it. So he would say, Kita Taka, Teri Kita, Taka Taka, Teri Kita. Kita Taka Teri Kita, Taka Taka Teri Kita. Kita Taka Teri Kita, Taka Taka Teri Kita. Gira Nama Teri Kita, Kita Taka Teri Kita. And we were told you have to do it three and a half times faster than you say it. So you had to say, Kita Taka Teri Kita. So I wrote this piece for my uh, first tabla teacher. I had four. My first tabla teacher was Pandit Tarnath Rao. My second tabla teacher was Leonis Shinneman. My third tabla teacher was Swaplan Chowdhury. And my final uh, Tabla teacher who also taught uh, Gautam and Kanjira was John Burgum. So this is uh, Tarna. <laughs>
Um, so both our traditions are oral traditions. There, there is no notation, and now there is. But when we started learning, uh, there was none. You would basically sit across from your teacher. They would recite to you, and this is how we learn to play. It's an oral tradition as opposed to a written tradition. And if you if you stop and think of reading uh, a language you don't know without hearing it, in the West, music is taught that way. You don't necessarily hear it before you play it. You kind of hear it while you learn it. As opposed to if somebody's teaching you a language, if they're speaking to you in that language, then you hear the sound, the inflection, the breath, the phrasing, as opposed to just trying to get it from a piece of paper. Uh, but uh, that's a, another story. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask George to uh, speak about this folk method. Uh, in an attempt to kind of like give you an overview and uh, samples of different uh, forms of Japanese music, uh, again, staying within the, the folk uh, genre, um, this next piece includes two songs that we kind of put together. The first, and, and actually the whole uh, piece is a sort of visualization so I invite you to visualize. Japan is a very mountainous country, volcanic island chain, and very steep mountain passes. Uh, men would lead strings of horses, their backs piled high with hardwood, charcoal, rice. And they would travel from village to village. And as, as they walk through these beautiful mountain passes, uh, bamboo groves and orchids and you name it, just beautiful scenery. They would sing and in, in a way, again, like uh, the yodeling of the Alps, their, their voices would kind of do a yodeling style. So they would sing. And the folk knowledge is that by singing, they were kind of like scaring away the bears and uh, other animals that might attack them. <laughs> so, anyway. um, so they, they would sing these songs. So that's the first part of this medley. The second part, lullabies are beautiful, beautiful examples of any culture's music. And for Japanese, lullabies are very, very, there are beautiful lullabies all over, depending on what part of Japan you're in. Um, this next, that section, this section that we go into, you can imagine that the back horse driver is walking into a village and there's rice growing and a bamboo grove. Um, the song is, called Takeda no, Takeda no Komori Uta, the folk song, the lullaby of the village Takeda.
we're at the 45 minute mark, so we're going to do the polls next. And then we'll take questions. We're right now at a 45 minute mark, and we have an hour total, so we're going to do a very quick last piece for you. And then we'll move to take questions and answers. And I'm going to ask George to describe what this is about. <laughs> oh, this is a full text. Uh, yeah. Baka Odori uh, in Japanese, that's the title of it. It's called the Fool's Dance, if you translate it. Um, the words or the refrain that runs through it, it's, it's kind of shouted out, is those who watch are fools. Those who dance are fools. If you're going to be a fool, you might as well dance. Uh, I invite you to dance. You've been sitting for a long time, probably. If you have enough space, this is a free form dance. Basically, you just wave your hands around and you bounce. Okay? You make faces at each other if you're lucky enough to be with somebody else. And dance. Hey, Christopher. Yeah. Um, let me see. Nothing's coming up yet. Oh, here's one. Oh. Can you read it or do you want me to read it to you? Uh, is the flute in traditional Japanese music regional or universal? Do you have any questions at all that we can answer? Uh, can you can you hear me, Christopher? Let me ask. Can you hear me? Oh. Yeah, I can hear you. I okay. can hear you and I can see you too. Here's a question. Is the flute in traditional Japanese music? Can you not see us? No. Yeah. No, I can see you. I'm just, I didn't know if you could hear the question I was asking. I see it now. The question is, yeah. is the is the. Um, yeah, in the olden days, uh, almost each village had its own uh, song, and uh, they were, would have been taught from father to son or grandfather to his grandson, you know, and taught in that kind of tradition. Um, and uh, there are, for example, uh, the, the lullabies of uh, Tokyo, Edo, or Tokyo. Uh, there are the lullabies of Osaka, and so specific places had their own songs. The flutes themselves were uh, sometimes six hold, sometimes nowadays it's seven hold, and it's uh, this this flute is tuned to a Western scale. Uh, that's so that 
it's easier to play with, with other Western instruments, uh, guitars or um, keyboard or whatever. So uh, this is kind of a modern version of the Japanese yokobue. Yokobue means side flute. Very simple instrument, just a bamboo tube with holes in it. And again, found all over the world. Um, yeah, common hmm. to cultures all over the world. Is a, is a flute something that needs to be tuned? Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I was just curious if a flute is something Say that, that needs one to more be... time. Does the flute need to be tuned? Yeah. So the tunes, uh, the, the flutes are usually tuned, correct me if I'm wrong, George, to the pentatonic scale, right? Or they're mostly yeah, used the, in a pentatonic scale? The standard uh, shakuhachi, for example, is tuned uh, so that the closed pipe is D. As I lift my fingers, it goes from D to D, F, G, A, C, and then back to the D. So it's a pentatonic scale, uh, but uh, using a combination of half hole. It's possible to get a lot of, it's impossible actually to get a chromatic scale. It's not made for that. So people who play Bach on Shakuhachi, I think they're crazy. Uh, <laughs> play it on a flute, you know, whether it's made for it. Or uh, what I mean is a concert. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So okay. If that answers your question. Yeah. There's another one. Um, how many instruments uh, do you each know how to play? Do you, I'm assuming. Do you each know how to play? <laughs> Go ahead, George. <laughs> I, I, play, I play various uh, types of uh, drums, taiko. Uh, I belong to, I belong to, I, I've kind of like moved on, but I belong to a group called Hinara Taiko, one of the first uh, taiko groups in the United States. Uh, Taiko is now very popular. It's on uh, college, camp college campuses throughout the United States. And uh, there are Taiko groups in almost every city. Uh, ours was one of the first in the United States. So I played various kinds of Taiko. Uh, I played also some ancient court music of Japan. Uh, actually, it, it came over from China to Japan, but uh, Faded out, no longer is played in Japan, in China, but uh, from the Tang Dynasty. In Japan, it was uh, kind of kept alive by the imperial household and used for ritual, um, and used as ritual music for ceremonies. So I play a number of different instruments. It's, he also plays Western instruments too. I, uh, my earliest exposure to uh, instruments was, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the metal clarinets. In grammar school, I played one of the B-flat clarinets that were made out of metal. Yeah? <laughs> All right. We have, uh, we have one last question here. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll kind of just read it out loud. Also being that the wind instruments require lots of air for continuous notes, does it make a difference to sit cross-legged instead of, say, on a chair where you'd be able to inhale more air into your lungs? I guess, does it make a difference to your sitting position and your ability to... Can you say to... that one more time? Yeah, the oh. question is... Can... Yeah, the question is asking, does it make a difference between sitting cross-legged or on a chair when you're playing a wind instrument? Uh, traditionally, it's played uh, in Buddhist style, it's played in seiza, which is really on your knees. Uh, and maybe that's the way it should be played. Uh, I can't sit seiza then for 45 minutes. It's, it's too, that's the Zen style of sitting meditation, right? Uh, and that's great for your breathing. Yeah. So uh, for me, uh, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, I'm uh, Japanese American. I can't sit that way <laughs> for long. Yeah, yeah, understandable. Um, well, that's it for the questions. Um, Christopher, is there anything else you wanted to talk about with your instruments? Well, I, 
Well, I just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you for having us. It's uh, uh, The library has always been a place to go to to find what, I mean, since I was a kid, uh, to find what I don't know. When I wanted to research something, like I said, there was no internet at that time. I would like to share that uh, my youngest, our youngest daughter, my youngest daughter, uh, she's, she used to go to the library three times a week when she was uh, uh, elementary and middle school. She's 20, 24 now, and she has two degrees, two bachelor's degrees, one in history, one in anthropology. She's getting her master's in December. She's going to get her, her PhD, and she's a full-time archaeologist. So uh, right. the library was that place for her to go to, to get all the – and now, uh, well, since she was a child, now you can go to any L library and ask for any book and if they don't have it they will mail it to your library which th did not happen when i was a youngster so uh even if you don't you know the, i would rather go to a book than the internet anytime <laughs> all right well uh yeah thank you so much this was wonderful yeah uh, just delightful to the ears so i really appreciate it thank you so much for uh, for playing all of your instruments today thank you very much we hope to see you again thank you okay yeah and uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's LA Made program. Remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And we will hope you will join us again Thursday, May 27th at 4 p.m. for LA Made's program, Jai Ma, Traditional Chinese Instruments and Electronic Music. Musician and composer Jai Ma plays traditional Chinese instruments and electronics in a concert celebrating her Chinese heritage. LA's cultural diversity and the inspirational spirit unique to Los Angeles. It'll be streaming live on YouTube and Facebook. We really appreciate all your support and uh, hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot.